was somewhat familiar with them, but the level of familiarity varies greatly amongst Catholics. So to make sure that we're all on the same page, we're going to go through them briefly, and then we're going to discuss how to relate your temperament to your spirituality. So to begin with, the temperaments come to us from Greek medicine. They were invented by this dude, Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, and he lived around 400 BC. He came up with the thought that people's dispositions or personalities were related to four humors or different fluids found in the body. So there was blood, which in Latin is called sanguis, which is where we get the name sanguine, and that comes from the heart. Then there's yellow bile, or in Greek, chole, choleric, and that comes from the liver. And then we have black bile, which is not exactly black, it's sort of a brownish, reddish, nasty color. <laughs> <laughs> and in Greek, that's melos for black, and then chole for bile, so you get melancholic, and that comes from the kidneys. And lastly, you have phlegm. Or that. But if you do 
develop virtue, you can strengthen the things that are already strong. You can cultivate your strengths. And then you can overcome your weaknesses through virtue. So if you do these things, some people would argue that that's changing your temperament. Other people would argue that that's just becoming more virtuous. So, which is it? I will leave that up to you to determine. The temperament determines what response you are naturally inclined to make in a particular situation. And through virtue, the goal is to develop the capacity to respond appropriately to any situation as it comes up, whether or not that response comes naturally to you. So, how do you figure out what your temperament is? I like to lay out the temperaments in approximately this basic order. It's very helpful for reasons that are about to become apparent. The first distinction that we can make is whether a person is extroverted or introverted. So if you think to yourself, if you have a free evening, would you rather hang out with some friends or would you rather chill at home? If you would rather hang out with friends, you are likely extroverted. Yeah, if, you rather, yeah. if you would rather hang out at home, you're likely introverted. It can, however, be kind of difficult to determine this, because even introverted people do have friends. What? Yeah, what? <laughs> so fortunately, there are other ways to distinguish which of the temperaments you probably are. So for the purpose of this experiment, think about at some point in your life where something big happened to you. Something very momentous and exciting. Maybe you learned that you were having a new sibling. Maybe somebody that you were very close to died. If you think about that really big piece of news, did you react to it quickly? Or did you react to it more slowly? Did it take a while to sink in? If you reacted quickly, you are probably one of the upper two temperaments, either choleric or sanguine. If, you, if it takes a while for that big thing to sink in, you're probably one of the bottom two, either melancholic or phlegmatic. Then think about whether that thing had a huge mental impact on you. Did you think about it for weeks and months? and maybe even years afterwards? Or did you sort of process it and move past it and life as usual from the soon after that? If you're able to process it quickly and move on, that's considered a short impression, and so you're probably either sanguine or phlegmatic. If it lasts a really long time, that's a long impression, and that means you're either choleric or melancholic. So, at this point, you should have a sense of what temperament you might be. And then as we go through all of the four, we'll lay out some characteristics of each and see if one or perhaps two of these resonates really strongly with you. So we'll start with the sanguine temperament. These people, again, have a very strong initial reaction to something, and it does not leave a very long impression. They tend to be very extroverted. So this is the bubbly people person. They're the life of the party. Because they have a strong initial reaction, if something bad happens, they can fly off the handle easily. But they won't hold a grudge because they don't have a very long impression afterwards. On the other hand, they're quick to show enthusiasm for an idea. You come up with a plan, they say, oh yeah, that's a wonderful idea. And then when it comes time to actually put the plan into action, they blink out of it. And sanguine people tend to be very loquacious. Fancy word meaning they talk a lot. So an example of a sanguine person. I give you the headmaster, Mr. Lang. You may not guess it because he doesn't behave this way at school very often, but if you were to catch him at a faculty party, he is very loquacious. He's very energetic. He likes to crack jokes. And he likes to do fun. Yep, that's Mr. Legs. So each temperament has some positive characteristics and some negative ones. So the same one, 
Some of their positive characteristics are they're very friendly, they're very outgoing, they're very welcoming. They're always joyful and happy, a very good benefit to have, especially in the depressing world. They're not afraid of change. <laughs> they're not afraid of change. They're, they're okay with switching gears, doing the next thing, as long as the next thing is fun. They tend to be very easy to talk to and sociable. They agree easily to other people's wishes. So if you propose something to do, they don't care what it is they're doing as long as it's fun. So if it's somebody else's idea, that's perfectly okay. They don't tend to worry a lot, also a good thing. And they bring a lot of energy to group activities. So this is the type of person that you want to have on a youth group or a mission team. On the negative side, oh, they're also very candid and honest. That's a very helpful thing. It takes too much work to lie. On the negative side, they can tend to be superficial. They don't like to think deeply into something. So they stay on the surface level. They tend to be unstable, which means they lack tenacity. They don't stick with the thing for a long period of time. Since they're very social and gregarious, they can be uncomfortable being alone. They can be impetuous and impulsive, make rash decisions. And sometimes a lack of circumspect, circumspection. That's a fancy word meaning aware of their surroundings. So sanguine people sometimes bring things up without being aware of what situation or surrounding that they're in, and it might be fairly inappropriate. Like having an outburst at your wife or your kids in the line at the grocery store. They tend to talk first and then think afterwards, which leads them to put their foot in their mouth a lot of times. And they also tend to be disorganized. And hearkening back to the superficiality, they can also be vain. So a lot of sanguine women particularly spend a lot of time on their clothes and makeup. The next temperament is the choleric temperament. These people have a very strong initial reaction, and it also lasts a long time. So, my good opinion, once lost, is lost forever. <laughs> they, whatever they make their mind up to, they remember it forever. They also have plenty of mental energy, which is good, because they use that mental energy for arguing. <laughs> and they have no lack of things to argue about because they're very passionate and opinionated. <laughs> And they can be tempted 
If they see somebody under them doing work incorrectly, say, get out of here and let me do it. <laughs> they can tend to be impatient. Not only are you not doing your work right, you're doing it too slowly. And they tend to be prideful because, by golly, I'm the one getting all the work done around here, so I must be the one who's right all the time. <laughs> They're definitely tempted to be workaholics. So if you have a caloric husband, you may lose him to the office for 18 hours a day. He has tendencies in that direction. And because they're prideful, they're also stubborn because their ideas are, of course, always correct. <laughs> and because they're stubborn, they like to push their ideas on other people. <laughs> They also tend to be a 
control freak because everything must be perfect. And if everything is not perfect, the world is going to end. They tend to have a lot of self-doubt and pessimism. The world is a bad place. I'm a bad person. I'm not, a, I'm not perfect like I really want to be. And therefore, nothing is right. Since they're so sensitive, they're easily embarrassed. Although you may not notice this in the moment because, again, it takes a while for it to sink in. And they tend to get upset easily. But again, you won't notice until much later. So if you live with a melancholic person, you can tell when they're embarrassed or upset. But if you just happen to run into one and upset them, you probably won't notice it. And they tend to be seclusive. Because they don't like crowds, they sequester themselves away where they have a lot of silence and solitude for introspection. So you may not see them for long periods of time. They like to hide under rocks. <laughs> <laughs>
to regroup. We have people with a strong initial reaction, people with a weak initial reaction, people with a short impression, or people with a long impression. It turns out that most people have two temperaments. You have your primary one and also your secondary one, which you have also, but to a lesser extent. So most people are a combination of two. When you're a combination of two, there is some limit to what combinations you can have. Generally, if you find your primary temperament on the chart, you can have one that's next to it, but not one that's directly across from it. So you could be melancholic choleric or melancholic phlegmatic, but you cannot be melancholic sanguine. Although I have met a lot of people that claim to be melancholic sanguine. And still not convinced that this exists. Because if you think about it, if you're melancholic and sanguine, you are basically two polar opposites which are fighting with each other. Again, the same thing would be with choleric and phlegmatic, although I have not met any people who claim to have those two temperaments. There is a phenomenon that I think might explain why people think that they're sanguine melancholic or melancholic sanguine, and that is the concept of temperament masking. So, it turns out that if you are raised by someone who has a vastly different temperament than your own, you can learn and pick up traits of that temperament, and so it kind of looks like you have that temperament, even though you actually don't. A good example of this would be Mr. Z. If you meet him in a public place, you would probably guess that he's sanguine because he's bubbly and outgoing and he says a lot of crazy things. But he's actually melancholic phlegmatic. His mother is the most sanguine person I have ever met. <laughs> original temperament, 
and we want to get closer and closer to the middle where Jesus is. Make sense? Okay. So at this point, as we move into practical application of, of the temperaments, we should have a word of caution. Number one, do not use your temperament as an excuse. I'm not, I'm saying one. A very good example. A lot of people will say, it's okay if I'm superficial. I'm sanguine. I can get away with it. Don't use your temperament as an excuse. You still have a choice in what actions you take. Even though your temperament will predispose you towards certain actions, it's still your choice whether you do those things or not. So take responsibility for your actions. Don't just blame it on your temperament. And if you have faults due to your temperament, don't be satisfied with them. Don't just say, I am doomed to have this false all of my life because of my temperament. You actually need to work on correcting it. And lastly, be aware of other people's temperaments and treat them accordingly. For example, do not get into an argument with the choleric person unless you're willing to be there for a while. <laughs> Making a decision to actually put in the work to become a saint. 
you can totally do it. The sanguine to predominant fault tends to be some form of sensuality, so either lust or gluttony or some other form of sensuality. Every temperament has some natural virtues which should be encouraged and strengthened, and then they also have some natural vices, which means that you need to work on developing a virtue opposite to that to counteract it. So the sanguine's natural virtues, they're very joyful. They should be encouraged to continue to be very joyful. Obedience tends to come easily to them. So if you find a good spiritual director or a good superior, you should make sure that you're obedient to them because they generally know what's best for you. And it's easier for percent of people to be obedient to someone than to constantly have to make good decisions for themselves. And they naturally have the virtue of honesty. Because, again, it's too much work to lie, so why bother? Sanguine people should work on developing the virtue of modesty. So, we're probably fairly familiar with modesty of dress, but there are other forms of modesty as well. There's modesty of speech. Basically, if you don't have something good to say, don't say anything at all. If it's not going to help the conversation, and you're just saying it to hear yourself talk, don't bother. And then there's modesty of action. Basically, don't be a show-off. They should work on developing mortification of the senses. Under this category comes chastity. So particularly, in addition to what we normally think of when we think of chastity, they should practice custody of the eyes, making sure that they know where their eyes are going at all times. Temperance. So, mortification of the sense of taste, fasting and abstinence, maybe going on a bread and water fast. You need to practice detachment. This is a virtue that we don't often hear about. So Ignatius of Loyola explained that detachment means that you don't like things because they're good and dislike things because they're bad. You like things because they bring you closer to God and you dislike things because they push you further away from God. So he said that we should not prefer wealth to poverty, or health to sickness, or a long life to a short life. We should just prefer whatever gets us closer to God. Maybe sickness is a good thing to get you closer to God, in which case it would be a good thing to be sick. So that's the virtue of detachment. They also need to practice silence because they're very gregarious and like to talk a lot. And sanguine people are very good at playing, but they need to practice working before they play. So get all your work done, and then go have fun. In case you're worried that this is impossible, there were quite a lot of saints who had the sanguine temperament. The foremost among them was St. Peter the Apostle. And you may remember him as the apostle who made impetuous decisions. So when Jesus was walking on the water and said, come get out of the boat and walk on the water with me, Peter didn't think twice, he just jumped out of the boat. And then afterwards he thought about it and started to sink. Or when Jesus was washing his feet and Peter objected and Jesus said, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me, he said, Oh, well then don't just wash my feet, wash my head and all the rest of me as well. <laughs> and he made promises like, Jesus, I will never leave you. I will never deny you. And then he didn't follow through. So, he was a saint one that came out pretty well in the end. Some other ones are Francis of Sales, St. Philip Neri, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Francis Xavier. St. Teresa of Avila is another good one. She, um, she was a sanguine, yet she wrote deep works about the interior life. If you read her writing, you might think that she was a melancholic. She had developed so much virtue that she had characteristics of the complete opposite temperament. So, choleric spirituality. Cholerics tend to be prone to anger and despair, but they react really well to reason and ideals. They tend to be very intelligent which can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. They don't like being still. They need to be constantly busy, constantly being productive, getting something done. 
they tend to be very prideful, which means that if something humiliates them, it hurts a lot. And so to prevent that happening, they can be tempted to deceit and hypocrisy to try to lie and cover up humiliating things. And their predominant fault is pride. Their natural virtues include fortitude, so great courage and strength, and then magnanimity, which literally means greatness of soul. It's usually defined as being noble or chivalrous. Things that they need to work on are humility to counteract the pride, meekness to counteract the anger, <clears throat> charity and kindness, because they can be pretty upset with people that are not choleric. <clears throat> Since they're very self-sufficient, they need to work on depending on God rather than depending on themselves. And it would be very beneficial to them to think a lot about the sufferings of others, and that helps them be more compassionate to others. Some cleric saints are St. Paul the Apostle. He was not afraid to argue, very opinionated, and got a lot of things done. St. John Bosco, St. Ignatius of Loyola, and St. Jerome, who is the person who translated the Bible into Latin, so we had a standard version of the Bible. Melancholics. Melancholics have a disposition towards sorrow. This is because they tend to focus too much on themselves. You wouldn't think that a melancholic is prideful, because they tend to think very poorly of themselves. They basically think they're lower than dirt. But if you remember, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. So, melancholic people don't do that. They think of themselves a lot. So even though they think of themselves negatively, that doesn't mean that they have the virtue of humility. Since they focus on themselves, they tend to be very sad. And they want delights to make themselves feel better. If something painful happens, their reaction toward that painful thing is likely to be permanent. And they tend to spend a lot of time being thoughtful, contemplative, which fortunately means they're very inclined towards reflection and piety. They're sympathetic and compassionate, and they're long-suffering, which means they can endure suffering for a very long period of time. They're very resilient under suffering, although they really don't like it, so they tend to avoid it. But when it happens to them, they generally take it very well. They're overly serious. And they have a very hard time revealing themselves to other people, which makes relationships difficult, and it also makes confession difficult. Their predominant faults, oh, there's a lot of them, pusillanimity. <laughs> this is basically the opposite of the magnanimity that we talked about before, so where magnanimity is nobility and chivalry, pusillanimity would be cowardice, or the opposite of nobility. And they tend towards scrupulosity, which is basically thinking that things that are not sins are actually sins. They tend to be overly hard on themselves. Natural virtues include prayer and piety. They're very good at that. Detachment, because the world is not that great anyway. Mercy <laughs> and compassion. They can feel other people's sorrows very deeply. They need to work on developing a joyous attitude. Sanguine people probably think that this is really easy, but for a melancholic, it's the hardest thing in the world to do. They need to work on developing fortitude, to have the strength to get through situations. Charity, so that they're thinking more about others and less about themselves. Hope, and then the last two are, again, trying to focus on trying to get you to think less about yourself. So you've got to stay busy, so you have less time to think. And then there's the concept of eutropelia, Greek meaning good play. Some, some game or some hobby that you actually truly enjoy and that's recreational for you. Most melancholics forget to work this into their day. And they have very boring lives as a result. 
Some famous melancholic saints were St. John the Evangelist, the disciple whom Jesus loved, St. Therese of Lisieux, Padre Pio, and St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Very impressive list there. Finally, phlegmatics. Phlegmatics do not have strong passions. They have a lot of common sense, though. They're very mentally balanced. They're very discreet. They tend to be passive. They get along well with others. But they're very inclined towards ease and comfort, which means they're also inclined towards comfortable things, like eating and drinking. I have noticed uh, anecdotally that Phlegmatic people tend to like to eat, and they're more likely than the other temperaments to be overweight. So fasting might be beneficial. I don't know. <laughs> Unfortunately, the phlegmatics have the most difficult time of the temperaments to become a saint. And this is mostly because it's difficult to get them off their rear ends. Once you have done that, though, the rest of the work is fairly straightforward. Their predominant fault would be sloth, which is a fancy word for laziness, especially towards spiritual things. Natural virtues, patience, again, very difficult to upset them. They're very patient, they're very affable, and they tend to persevere. So again, slow and steady, they just chug along, they get things done. They need to work on developing zeal. They don't tend to have strong passions, so they don't tend to go after something passionately. They need to work on developing temperaments. Temperance, again, with the eating and drinking thing. And they need deep convictions. But there were some very popular, like, like saints. At the head of the list, St. Thomas Aquinas. Probably the most intellectual saint in the history of the world. St. John the 23rd, a relatively new one. St. Gregory, and that's about it. St. <laughs> <laughs> Helpful Resources. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you want to look further into temperaments, there are a few places that I would recommend that you go. First of all, there's a book called Four Temperaments by Father Conrad Hawk. It's a small booklet, it's very quickly, uh, quick to read. You might be able to find a free version online, but if you want to purchase one, Catholic bookstores usually have them, you can find it on Amazon. And I would recommend giving this as gifts to people who want to begin learning more about the temperaments. If you want something more in depth, there is The Temperament God Gave You. It's a much thicker book, and it has more modern language. It's more geared toward the relational aspect of the temperaments, which is why there are sequels talking about your spouse's temperament and your kids' temperament, which for most of the students probably is not an issue at the moment. But if you want to research for future use, you can go there. There's a series of articles which you can find online if you just Google The Four Temperaments by Father Christian Pappas. It's this is a series of articles. It runs over the four temperaments, each in depth, and it talks more about spiritual advice for each of the temperaments. He was writing to spiritual directors of religious communities who had to oversee large numbers of people and give them solid spiritual advice. And then finally, if you're looking for something to listen to, you can look on YouTube and find a talk on the temperaments by the indomitable father Remember, He gives a very awesome discussion on the temperaments, and he also goes into the spiritual aspects of the temperaments. So you can go on the father's website at sensustraditionis.org. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have finally come to the end.